This gorgeous coin represents one Turkish lira. Back in 2011, I could use this very coin to buy 25 slices of bread in Turkey. However, the same coin would only get me six slices of bread in 2021. On the other hand, here in Belgium, I needed almost two euros to get those same 25 slices of bread. And believe it or not, 10 years later, these same two euros would get me almost 27 slices of bread. And since the price of bread is global, that's a pretty strong indication that the problem hasn't been the price of bread in Turkey. No, it's more likely that the lira was losing its value fast. But okay, since this is a money and macro channel, we cannot just rely on bread prices to test that hypothesis. Instead, we'll use representative baskets of goods and services that reflect what people typically buy. These baskets also take into account that people in Turkey might have slightly different needs than people in Belgium. Okay, very stereotypically, let's just add some chocolate and some beer to my Belgian basket and some white cheese and some olives to my Turkish basket. This is what the consumer price index essentially does. If we look at the Belgian basket, then $200 uh, would roughly get me this basket in 2011. But then today I only get 80% of a similar basket. So even though I could buy more bread with a euro after 10 years, it seems to have lost roughly 20% of its purchasing power when we use the consumer price index basket. And while that sounds like a bad score, that's actually in line with the 2% inflation target of the central bank each year. Next, let's assume that this gorgeous 100 lira note would have bought you this representative basket in 2011. How much of that basket do you think you could still buy using that same 100 lira note today? Stop the clock. Oh, start the clock. Okay, the answer is 20%. Just 20% of that basket. So in 10 years, the euro lost roughly 20% of its value, while the lira only kept roughly 20% of its value. On top of that, if you look at a graph of inflation in Turkey and compare that to inflation in Belgium, you can clearly see that inflation in Turkey is not only much higher, but also much more volatile. So it sure sounds like the lira is broken, but is it really? Well, let's have a look at the three classic functions of money. Store of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. Is the lira a stable store of value? Clearly, it's not. Can you reliably use it as a unit of account? For example, to account for what 25 slices of bread are worth? Now, given that Turkish inflation is estimated to hit a whopping 70% this year, it's less and less the case. And at that rate, we're even getting to a point where using the lira as a unit of exchange is getting less and less attractive. But what does make sense is that many of you who live in Turkey told me that it's increasingly common for you to hold your wealth in the form of foreign currency denominated bank accounts, gold and crypto. And if it's up to the sponsor of this video, fine art will soon join the ranks of these traditional safe assets. You see, Masterworks is a platform with over 400,000 users that is making it possible for regular people to invest in the massive $1.7 trillion fine art market. A market that has even outpaced the US stock market over the last two decades. How it works is that Masterworks actually buys art pieces from famous artists such as Banksy and Monet. Then they allow regular people to invest in a share of these artworks. Finally, when Masterworks sells the piece, the shareholders will share in the profits. However, if you want to diversify your portfolio to include fine art, it's important to realize that there is a waiting list. But not for money and macro viewers. They can skip the Masterworks waiting list by clicking the link in the description of this video. So have a look if that sounds interesting. That being said, for now the main safe assets for Turks are still bank deposits. In fact, a whopping 64% of Turkish bank accounts are now denominated in foreign currencies such as dollars or euros rather than Turkish liras. So clearly the lira is broken. But then the questions become, why is it broken and how can we fix it? Luckily, understanding why the lira is broken is rather easy. We can simply explain it using the go-to tools of economics, supply and demand. So if the lira is losing purchasing power, that either means that there is too much supply or not enough demand. And if the lira is too volatile, that's obviously because supply or demand are too volatile. But okay, I guess this then raises a lot of new questions. Is there too much lira supply or is there not enough demand for the lira? And 
why are these two so volatile? Well, to answer these questions, let's have a look at the inflation graph that we saw earlier. As you can see, inflation used to be fairly low in the 60s and 70s. But at this time, Turkey's economy was almost completely closed off from the outside world, and it was rather small because of it. So then in 1980, when it started opening up its economy to qualify for EU membership, expectations were high. One of the promises of EU membership was that if Turkey would open up its economy, to foreign money, then this could be invested in its economy. This inflow would simultaneously increase the supply of lira and also grow the economy and therefore the demand for liras. Thus, it needn't have increased inflation. But clearly, it did. What can explain this? Well, as famous Turkish economist Danny Roderick notes, Instead, policy followed a mix of liberalization with patronage politics detrimental to monetary discipline. Financial liberalization reduced demand for base money at the same time that fiscal balances came under increasing strain due to external transfers. What he means by liberalization is opening up to international financial markets. In other words, the government now had access to money of wealthy Western investors. And with patronage politics, Ruddick means that the government used that foreign money to bribe voters rather than to spend it productively into its economy. A less productive economy then means that the government gets less tax revenues. Finally, when he talks about increasing external transfers, he means that the government was getting more indebted to these foreign investors and therefore needed to pay them more interest payments. But remember that its tax base did not increase. So the easiest way to solve this problem was then to print more liras and convert that to foreign currency to pay off its debts. Thus leading to very, very high inflation and many, many debt crises. This dysfunctional dynamic between government debt and inflation became a particularly pressing problem around 2001. This is when Turkey got really serious about joining the EU and possibly the Eurozone, for which having very low inflation is a stringent requirement. And because the European dimension is so important for this story, I decided to collaborate with one of my favorite European content creators, Hugo, from the channel into Europe. Bonjour. Turkey was involved with the European project for a long time. It signed an association agreement with the European Economic Community, the precursor to the EU, in 1963, applied for the EU in 1987, and finally received candidacy status in 1999. That created momentum for reform, both politically and economically. So it was at this point that that government brought in the IMF. Now they gave the Turkish government some familiar advice. Stop all spending right now and let efficient financial markets just do their thing. This also meant a completely free lira, meaning that its international value would now be determined by foreign exchange markets completely. The result was an immediate drop in the lira and a massive recession. But when Erdogan got to power in 2003, Turkey already seemed to have entered a new era of economic prosperity. Both foreign and local finance were let loose and government spending on patronage was reined in. Sure, the supply of lira exploded, but because the economy was being built up, so did demand for lira. Not surprisingly, inflation was stable around 10% and Erdogan became one of Turkey's most popular politicians. Yes, I know, some channels on YouTube would happily claim that 8.5% of inflation in the United States is hyperinflation. But for Turkey, steady inflation of 10% was like a breath of fresh air. However, while all seemed well at the surface, the way that Turkey pursued its impressive growth was ultimately not sustainable for two reasons. The first reason is that it relied too heavily on what I call a finance-based growth model. What I mean by that is that Turkey did not follow China's export-led growth model. This would mean discouraging consumption, encouraging exports and encouraging investment in industry. Sure, Turkey did quite a bit of this and it did actually build a fairly impressive industrial base. However, it relied too heavily on its booming property market to bring in fresh new investments to get itself more foreign currency. And foreign fueled property booms are notorious for just making people feel wealthy. This temporarily pushes up the value of the currency because liras are needed to buy property in Turkey. Besides clearly not being sustainable, this led to two big problems. First, by pushing the currency up, it made Turkey's developing export industry less competitive. 
Second, it put a lot of purchasing power directly into the hands of Turkish citizens, which was immediately spent on importing. This then meant that whenever property markets slumped, the lira would crash as demand for it would quickly disappear. At the same time, Turks would keep supplying liras on the foreign exchange market because they couldn't just stop importing crucial goods. And then every time the lira fell, inflation would skyrocket because Turkey was so dependent on these imports, which would now get more expensive. The second reason that Turkey's growth model was ultimately not sustainable is because of something that economists call dollarization. You see, following economic orthodoxy, Turkey actually had really high interest rates for a very long time. However, one problem for economies with these very high interest rates is that it incentivizes your own citizens to borrow in other currencies that don't have these high interest rates. Now this is one of the classical dangers for emerging market economies. To see why, imagine that you have a hundred liras worth of debt in euros. But now the lira loses half of its value. Now all of a sudden you will need 200 liras to pay off that same debt. And while this might be a problem for the person who is doing the borrowing, it will also be a big problem for your economy if all of your citizens have been doing this and all of a sudden your currency crashes. Now one clever way that countries can offset this is by encouraging some of their citizens to also hold foreign currency assets. So Turkey made it rather easy for its citizens to do this by giving them access to Turkish bank accounts denominated in euros and dollars. So okay, now great, many Turks had borrowed in dollars, but also a lot of Turks had dollar assets. But from a macroeconomic perspective, this can actually explain why even though the lira was often really volatile before, it never completely crashed. Because when it did, on average, country wealth remained the same. However, what they ended up doing was completely dollarizing their economy. Imagine this. In Turkey, there were two monetary economies. A dollar-euro-based one and a lira-based one. The lira-based one was getting smaller every year and the dollar-based one was getting bigger. So you can maybe already see now how relying on foreign property investors and imports and also dollarizing your economy made the Turkish lira much more volatile over time. If not, imagine the following scenario. The world gets hit by a massive pandemic. Then, after two years, a major war starts in Europe. The global inflation that follows entices the US Federal Reserve to then start raising interest rates. In dollarized and financialized Turkey, foreign investors start shifting money to the United States where they can now earn higher interest rates. This causes a drop in house prices and the lira. Meanwhile, your citizens see the lira plummeting and try to convert their remaining lira deposits into dollars. Now the lira is dropping even more and this means foreign investors lose even more and so on. You can clearly see that this is sort of a doom loop. In the meantime, in non-dollarized and non-financialized Turkey, this is happening. Why? Well, because not much has fundamentally changed about the strength of the Turkish economy. Its glorious beaches still there, its factories still there. I think you can see my point. So why is the lira broken? Well, I think that Turkey's finance-based growth model and dollarization are to blame for it becoming more fragile over time. And that brings us to how can we fix the lira? Let's quickly address the standard solution that people come up with first. Simply raise interest rates. Can this stop the doom loop? Yes. If you raise them high enough, you may actually be able to stop the fall of the lira. But it doesn't solve the main problems of finance-based growth and dollarization. In fact, it could make them worse by encouraging fickle foreign investors and discouraging local lira borrowers. After all, Turkey had high interest rates for years and the fundamental problems only got worse. So if people say that the problem with the lira is simply Erdogan's wacky interest rate moves, that's a very surface level analysis. Sure, that's not to say that it's smart to then lower interest rates when foreign investors are already running away as far as they can from the lira. But to really fix the lira, Turkey needs to definancialize and de-dollarize. Sure, it first needs to, so to say, stop the bleeding. Russia has recently shown that this can actually be done by raising interest rates quite a lot and by preventing money from leaving the country. And then once the currency stabilized, it's actually started lowering interest rates again. 
However, this would only be a temporary solution. After this, Turkey should move to a more sustainable export-based growth model such as the ones pursued by Japan and South Korea. This should actually be doable because when it comes to manufacturing, it's already exporting more than it imports. What's more, with a bit of COVID luck, tourists should soon flock back to the country and spend their lovely euros and dollars. The only reason why Turkey's central bank is still bleeding foreign exchange reserves is actually energy. You see, Turkey imports actually almost all of its oil and gas. But as Hugo can tell you, Turkey's government is actually already working on fixing this. With Turkish ambitions to become a regional powerhouse, it's looking to tackle the energy dependency that gives its rivals and potential rivals a stranglehold over its economy. Turkey is pursuing this policy through the construction of nuclear power plants, developing its own large gas field in the Black Sea, connecting with the gas fields of Azerbaijan, military interventions in Iraq, Syria, and Libya, and competition for natural gas resources in the eastern Mediterranean. These efforts to shore up its currency play into Turkey's ambitions, with the stalled prospect of becoming an EU member and a conflicting relation with some EU member states, and even the United States, which has threatened to cripple Turkey's economy under Trump, Turkey is looking to become more self-reliant. So then what's left is just its dollarization problem. But here again, it seems like the government is already working on it. Last December, it actually introduced a scheme that rewards those Turks that convert their euro or dollar deposits into lira deposits. How it works is that if the lira plus 14% interest rate does worse than the euro or dollar, then the government compensates the original account holder up to that amount. The idea here is that Turks will de-dollarize, which will push up the lira, and so the government would never actually have to pay out something at all. Risky, but pretty bold. And so far it seems to be working as the lira is now much more stable than it was before that scheme existed. So the good news is that actually the government has identified these two problems and is working on fixing them. But now for the bad news. In my opinion, there are three big problems that will prevent the lira from being fixed. First, the government saying one thing doesn't mean that it actually will do that. For example, when the government had announced that it wanted to limit foreign investment in property, it reversed those measures as soon as the lira came under pressure. Second, building a healthy economy that can support a healthy export industry is not easy. And given that Erdogan has a bit of a track record of appointing loyal people rather than competent people in key positions in the government, it's not sure that the government can still actually implement all of these plans. Finally, it might simply be too late. The scale of dollarization in Turkey is absolutely insane. And as we speak, the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to combat inflation at home. This might already put so much pressure on the lira that it's too late to stabilize it. So that leaves us with a pretty bittersweet conclusion about the future of this beautiful currency. It seems that elements of the government know what to do, but it doesn't mean that it will be done. In any case, it seems to be the Turkey's economy is charting its own path away from Western economies and the European Union. Or is it? If you want to know more about that, then check out this video over here on Into Europe's channel for a video about that, which I made with him. And if you want to know more about unorthodox ways that Western economists are considering taming inflation, check out this clip over here of me talking to Unlearning Economics about price controls. Finally, if you want to discuss these and other economic issues with me in a small Discord server, then consider becoming a patron or member of the Money & Macro channel using the links in the description.